Good morning. Yeah. Jamie, um, is this a, an identity crisis? Uh, uh, Denver is a long ways away from here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie. If you appreciate Jamie Holden, would you give it up for him right now? Yeah. So I'm a man. Get over it. There's a lot of um, a, a lot of dialogue going on in culture today. This is uh, such a time of identity crisis in in our nation. I heard a story about uh, a bunch of guys went to heaven and and uh, they had two lines to get into heaven. The one line was the manly men line, and the other line was the hen-picked men line. And quite frankly, guys, the hen-pecked line was really long. And the manly men line was just a couple deep. And there was this one guy, and he was standing, in, he was the last one in, in the manly men line going into heaven. And there were some other guys, and they were kind of, you know how guys do, just sizing him up. And he was kind of frail, and... Didn't look the part and kind of, do you understand what line you're in? He goes, yeah, I understand. They said, well, how do, you, how do you get it? All of us guys are over here in the henpecked line. How do you get to be in the manly men line? He said, I don't know. My wife told me, go stand over in that line and here I am. <laughs> Subtitle of my message this morning is Rise Up, O Men of God. The world needs men of God. Can I get a good amen? amen? Men who are clear and secure in their gender identity, gender identity and who demonstrate with clarity what it looks like to be a man serving the Lord. The world needs men of God. The church needs men of God. Men who are clear and secure in uh, what it looks like to be a man who serves God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. The church needs a model of this. The family needs men of God. Men who are clear and secure in their gender and spiritual identity and who demonstrate with clarity what it looks like to be a man who serves the Lord, loves his wife, cares for his children, and leads his family. Listen, I'm not talking about being some Neanderthal guy. Someone who barks loud and, and is boisterous and, and, and uh, it, uh, that is not what I'm talking about. But this morning what I'm talking about is knowing who and what we are and taking our place in culture, church, and family. In the last campaign, the presidential campaign, and here we go again, I have come to hate this year. But in the last campaign, Joe Biden proposed, he said it over and over again, and I couldn't agree with him more. He said, we are fighting for the soul of our nation. I don't agree with his methodology. Don't agree with, uh, I'm not going to go down that dark alley. It's a dark, dark alley. But we are fighting for the soul of a nation. We need men of God to help in that fight. Question is, are we prepared men? Are we prepared in this room for spiritual warfare? Because that comes along with fighting for the soul of our nation. There has never been more confusion over basic issues than there is today. I never in all my life, I'm 63 years old, I had never imagined as a young person that our culture would be where it is today. Can you imagine bringing our grandparents back to visit us in our day? 
All I could, all I could imagine is them shaking their head back and forth the whole time. There's confusion over basic issues. Basic issues of what is right and what is wrong. What is moral and what is immoral. Clarity versus ambiguity. Even to sexual identity. There's confusion. And I, 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 again, I sit back and I muse over this and I say, how can this be? You know, when I was a kid growing up, sexual identity, all you had to do is change a baby's diaper. And it, you figured it out right, right quick. Amen. And today there's, there's conversations that bring tremendous amount of confusion and chaos to things that are rather self-revealed. I believe that part of that is the work of the enemy. Identity is at the core of much of our cultural conflicts today. You see, if Satan can steal your identity, he can control your life. Biblically, we understand that we have been created in God's own image. Satan has always lusted after God's position. And so Satan is trying to make people after his image. And our world today is swallowing the bait, hook, line, and sinker. We need men of God who have clarity of perspective and consistency of character to fight on their knees, proclaim a clear gospel witness in culture, in church, in the family. And demonstrate that serving God and staying true to his word are worth the world's considering for their lifestyle. Can I get a good amen? So this morning I'm going to refer to this text. I love Acts. I love the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 6, we have this, uh, this occurrence. The, the church is fairly new. It's thriving. It's growing. It's expanding. But it's not without problems. Churches have problems, right? You know why churches have problems? Look at your neighbor and you'll see why. It's because it's filled with human beings. And as long as the church is filled with human beings, it's going to have some problems. So we come to Acts chapter 6, and it's the second problem that emerges in the early church. And there was, a, there was a fight that broke out. Go figure. Now in those days, Acts chapter 6 verse 1 says, The number of disciples was multiplying. Can we get a good amen there? That's the way it's supposed to be. The number of disciples was multiplying, and there arose a complaint. Circle the word complaint, because it's in the Bible. Complain against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. What was happening was there was a little bit of bigotry, or at least it seemed that way. You had those of Jewish heritage and those of non-Jewish heritage and the, the, those of the Jewish heritage seemed to be being favored and those of the non-Jewish heritage seemed to have been neglected. And the 12 summoned the multitude of disciples. They, had a, they, got, a, they got together and they had a business meeting. They pulled everyone together and they said this, it is, not desir- it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. This isn't our function. And so they're going to set up a system of delegation. And verse 3 is the one that I have highlighted in my Bible. Therefore, brothers, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will appoint them over this business. We'll give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
And here's a a miracle in Acts chapter 6. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Hey, friends, if you can please a whole multitude, if you can come up with a plan that resonates with the vast majority, it's a miracle. Can I get an amen there? And so they chose Stephen, and there's a list of seven men. They laid hands on them and prayed. And in verse 7, it gives the outcome of this. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multitude multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of priests were obedient to the faith and I I think that we could insert the word even and even a great many priests there was there were great things happening how did it happen some men of God rose up to the occasion they were identified by the group and they assumed their leadership position Everyone in the room is a leader in some way, shape, or form. We have to lead ourselves, lead those close to us, and, and like throwing a pebble in a pond or concentric circles, and we keep leading as the Lord provides opportunity. Three things I want to talk about. Rise up, O man of God. Rise up in what way? Here's number one. You need to have a good reputation. That was one of the qualifications for what we now look at as the deacons of the church. But it's not just deacons. It's not just titles. These are functions and, they, and, and, and the qualifications apply broadly and throughout our personal lives, not only in church life. A good reputation. What does that include? Three things. A good reputation includes ethics, integrity, and morality. That's how you get a good reputation. Knowing what's right and wrong and then doing what's right. Being a man of our word. That's integrity. Having a clear sense of what's right and what's wrong. How are we going to get a clear sense of what's right and what's wrong? In our culture today, what's wrong is being called right. We need to know our Bible. The Bible needs to be in our heart and grafted in our souls. So that we can get through this despicable age of chaos and confusion. Know what's right and wrong. Do what's right. Shun the wrong. Do the right. Consistently, publicly, and privately. Good reputation is noted and known by others. We are epistles read of men, Paul says. We're a book, and our book is open. And there may be pages and chapters that we try to hide, but sooner or later, the real stuff comes out. Isn't that true? I came to a community as a youth pastor many decades ago now. (laughs) And while we were just getting into the community, uh, my wife and I were out shopping. She was shopping for a pair of shoes, go figure. And the fellow who was uh, waiting on us said, so what do you do? How many, (laughs) yeah, as a pastor, when you answer that question, you are immediately pigeonholed. And I said, well, I'm a a pastor on staff at such and such a church. And he said, hold on to your wallet. (laughs) What do you mean, hold on to my wallet? He said, I had a guy from that church do some work around my house. He was a contractor. And he, he rooked me. He came in and... He underbid, and then he had to keep adjusting his price, and the work that he did wasn't his quality. And he said, I ended up paying three times what I should have paid for that job. 
Hold on to your wallet if you're going to be in that church. And I thought, my, my heavens, how quickly I was pigeonholed in that moment because of someone else's reputation. On the other hand, let me tell you about a guy named Bobby. I was, uh, I was on my way home from the office one day and I was going by a florist and I stopped. I thought I'd, uh, you know, win some points with the wife. <laughs> and pull in and get some flowers and the lady asked me, what do you do? Here we go again. I passed her Faith Assembly Church and she goes, oh, I know a guy from your church. Here we go. So let me tell you what happened. I'm like, oh, Jesus, deliver me, please. Quick story. She said, I, my kids were late. They missed the bus. I had to take them to school. It was raining out. And they were late. And so I just put on a bathrobe and jumped in the car and traveling across town and got a flat tire. She said, I, I was stuck. I'm not dressed properly and it's raining out. And she said, I'm sitting along the road with my four-way flashers going on and there comes a knock at my window. And it was a guy from your church. He said, I see you have a flat tire. Pop the trunk and I'll change it for you. He stood out in the rain, did the, did the deed, changed the tire, put all the equipment back in the trunk, taps on the window. She said, look, I, if you'll give me your, your address, I'd like to send you some money. I don't even have my wallet with me. He said, forget it. Just here's how you can repay me. Go to church Sunday. Yeah, that's the kind of, that's the kind of stuff that reinforces a good reputation. Now listen, we're all made of flesh and blood, right? We all mess up. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there is none righteous, no, not one. And everyone in this room, from time to time, we have issues. Am I right? Look at your neighbor, get your preaching finger out. You do, the, you do my heavy lifting here. Look at your neighbor and say, you have issues. <laughs> you are enjoying this way too much. Take your preaching finger and point to the guy in your seat and say, you have issues too. Isn't it the truth? So I'm driving up the mountain. It's the opening day of rifle season. It's a gorgeous day. Snow is falling. And um, I, have a, I had a Ford Ranger splash. It, it didn't have four-wheel drive. It was rear-wheel drive. And I'm driving up a friend's property. And there's no snow removal. Four or five inches of snow on the ground. And I know it's going to happen. There's no way I'm going up this hill. But he said, go ahead, Don. Just back up and get a run and see if you can make it up. And I'm making it. I'm making it. And there's just this little knoll of the hill. If I can make it to that little knoll of the hill, I'm going to make it up over that. And I'm going to get back to my hunting spot. And I'm going. And by the way, my 12-year-old son's sitting next to me. And we're going, we're going, good. And you start to feel it slipping and you back off on the gas and you try to, try to nurture it, try to nudge it. And I'm stuck in the middle of the hill. And I had a moment of weakness. And I shot out an expletive. You know what an expletive is, right? I swore. It was 30 degrees out, and I'm sweating bullets. It's my 12-year-old son sitting next to me. And it was the first time in his life that he heard his dad swear. And I was, I was having a come-to-Jesus moment. And I knew what I needed to do. So I bowed my head and prayed out loud, Dear God, please forgive me for swearing. 
losing my temper. And then I looked at my 12-year-old son and I said, Ben, please forgive me. That is not the kind of dad I want to model to you. And that was the end of it. You know, sometimes we have to suck up our pride and do what's right. Because I wanted my son to see that even if his dad had a bad day and said a swear word, it wasn't the swear word, but it was a swear word, that this is what a man of God does. He confesses his faults and confesses his sin and does it as openly as the sin was and make it right with God and make it right with man. Now, I had a bad day, turned into a good day. Reputation. Now, I have a reputation for swearing, so that's not a good day. I don't do that often. But what's your reputation? What's my reputation? Brethren, choose out from among you seven men. One, good reputation. Two, full of the Holy Spirit. Rise up, O man of God. What do we mean by being full of the Holy Spirit? There are two things, and we only have a few moments to go through this. There are two things being full of the Holy Spirit. Number one, being full of the Holy Spirit means we have a robust growth process going on in our lives. That's called the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? And here's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I heard a story about Benjamin Franklin. He had 12 virtues that he listed. And he would track himself weekly, one virtue a week, to see how he was doing, improving in his personal character. Now, Benjamin Franklin, to my knowledge, was not a religious or a godly man. But he had enough of character in him to know that he needed to be aware of what his character was and was he improving in it. Rise up, O man of God. How are you doing? How am I doing? Let's ask ourselves that question. Love, not just feeling loved, but making other people feel loved. Demonstrating it like Bob did. Joy, not just being joyful, although that's a good thing, it's a desirable thing, but does my impact in other people's lives cause them more joy than discomfort? Peace. Yeah, we all want to feel that sense of peace and calm, but does my influence in other people's lives increase their experience of peace? That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's both personal, but also creating a culture of it. Love, joy, peace. How about patience? Isn't that your favorite? Is there anyone here who would confess that there are times you struggle with patience? Absolutely. Welcome to the human race. But that's not an excuse to not grow in the area of patience. How about kindness and gentleness, goodness and faithfulness and self-control? I would encourage you to write out or print out the fruit of the Spirit and put it in a place that you visit often. That'll either be the refrigerator or the toilet. (laughs) But find a place where you can reflect on these virtues, on these 
fruit and ask ourselves that question. And it becomes the filter through which our behavior flows. We ask ourselves that question. Does that reflect love? Did what I just do reflect love? I don't want to confess too much to you this morning. But my wife is in Texas. She has a grandbaby addiction. <laughs> and she's in Texas. And Monday I'm going to go join that addiction. But um, one of our grandkids had a, that she was going to visit had a fever. And we were back and forth. The last time she went and visited, she got COVID from the grandkiddos. The COVID turned into pneumonia. And it was a rough couple of months. And so she's navigating whether or not to go and the price of tickets and the hassle of canceling or rescheduling and there's cost associated with that. And I said, well, let's, and we had this discussion, we're going back and forth and she was waffling over it. And sometimes you just you gotta make a decision. It's 10 o'clock at night and you're flying out at six in the morning. And I and, and, and I, we had a call in. We're waiting for a call back from the airline. And uh, she said, I'm just going to go. I said, well, we're in the queue to have the conversation. Let's at least get information. She goes, no, I'm gone. I said, no, we're going to have a conversation. And she was in the other room and, and she said, don't talk to me like that. <laughs> One of us is going to have to say, I'm sorry first. Rise up, O oh man of God. There comes a time where, okay, I snapped. I wasn't kind. That wasn't a reflection of gentleness. And it surely didn't show her how much I loved her. And so she came in and apologized. <laughs> 43 years of marriage, we've never had a fight. And because we have integrated into the culture of our marriage a quick response to say, I'm sorry. And so we just said, I lost my temper, I'm sorry. And no, I was waffling over the decision, I'm sorry. And so then we fight over who's sorriest, all right. Rise up, O oh man of God. Are you full of the Spirit? The two parts of that, one is full of the fruit of the Spirit, the other is full of the, the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit don't come to us willy-nilly. The gifts of the Spirit come to us through Proximity, being close to God, talking to Him regularly, seeking His face, praying and asking God, would you do the work in me that can handle you giving me or giving through me one of these gifts of the Spirit. And gifts of the Spirit are found in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongue, well, it talks about the... 1 Corinthians 13 talks about the integration of fruit and gift. You see, to have the gifts without the fruit is to have imbalance in your life. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongue of men of angels but have not love, I'm just making a lot of noise. I become a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. We need the fruit, amen? We need the gifts too, amen? And so the manifestation of the Spirit is given by the Spirit for the profit of all. We want to be of benefit to other people. What are the, the gifts of the Spirit? One is given a word of wisdom, to another a word of knowledge, to another faith, to another healings, to another miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment, discerning spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the gifts of tongues. There are nine different gifts of the Spirit. 
And, and I'll tell you what, folks, sometimes these are manifest publicly. Sometimes they're manifest quietly. Sometimes they are earth-shaking and bombastic. Other times they are quiet and powerful. I've had people share in my life a prophetic word. They didn't even know it was prophetic. Whenever I hear someone say, thus saith the Lord, my discernment antenna go up. And it better be of the Lord. When you say, thus saith the Lord, and you, put, we, you or I put words in God's mouth, you better do that with fear and trembling. Because God's a holy, jealous God. And I don't believe he puts up with nonsense. But he does give gifts through men and women to the church for the benefit, for the profit of all. Rise up, O man of God. Do we have a good reputation? Number two, are we filled with the Holy Spirit? I know a lot of guys are filled with something. <laughs> I don't know that it's holy. And I don't know that it's the Spirit. Our culture needs this. They need to see it in us. And please, please, please understand me. I'm not talking about wackadoodle Christianity. I'm not talking about something that is so filled with, with uh, uh, excitement, but it doesn't have any... Thank you for that. I was going to say brains, but meat is a lot nicer. Rise up, O oh man of God. Number three, full of wisdom. We need to be growing in our ability to lead, to articulate, to help, and to show this world what it means to be a man who loves God. We need wisdom. Proverbs 13.20 says, when we walk with the wise, we become wise. How many of you know you become like those that you hang out with? It's not just true of teenagers. It's not just true of what we used to talk so much about peer pressure. If we associate with people of wisdom, how can we do that? Well, we get in close proximity to them. Find somebody. When I was, when I was a, a, a young guy, I, I loved to play tennis. Still like to play. Uh, now pickleball. <laughs> Don't have to move as much. But I learned something in my college days playing tennis that if you want to get better at playing tennis, the best thing you can do is find someone better than you and work out with them and, and play and lose and be humble. Yeah, that goes along with it. But your game goes up because who you are with affects how you produce. How about it in our lives today? You know, guys, sometimes we're kind of like lions. The bale lion is kind of a solitary creature. Powerful, yeah. But not real good at the social game. Men, we need each other. We need to be with each other. And it's kind of like a, there's an image that comes to my mind as we talk about this. I think of people who are climbing steep hills, climbing mountains. You see one guy, he's able to make it up and he's leading. But the next guy behind him, he reaches back and he helps pull him forward. We need that kind of thing going on in the church today. Men who have climbed, they've scaled the hill, they've gone up the mountain, but they're not going alone. And so they find someone else that they can reach back. Who do you have in your life? There are two things I want to ask today. Who do you have in your life that you reach up and they pull you forward? And I mean somebody that you're in close proximity with and in relationship with. And then the second part of that question is, who are you reaching behind to pull up to your level? 
We need these kinds of influences. How do I get to the place where I'm qualified to turn around and help someone else? I need to be full of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and I need to be full of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Solomon said in in Proverbs 9.10. And that's his word, his presence in our lives. Choose from among you seven men. Good reputation. Let's do a quick self-assessment. What kind of a reputation do I have? At work, at church, at home. Those who know me best, do they know me to be true to the character that I profess? I love a little book written by Donald Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld was the uh, chief of staff, I believe under Nixon. But uh, Reagan, thank you. And so Rumsfeld wrote a book called Rumsfeld's Rules. And um, it's just a compilation of life lessons that Rumsfeld picked up throughout the course of his life. Someone else's wisdom that had impacted him. And the book starts out with this story. Rumsfeld's father was in the Navy in World War II. So obviously he was away from home. And um, Donald Rumsfeld was uh, a ball player. He loved baseball. And he was also in scouts. And so he was moving toward that eagle badge. And uh, he decided that he wanted to pursue baseball more than scouting. And he wrote a letter to his dad telling him about this decision that he was contemplating. And his dad wrote him back. And he, just being a good father, said, I'll support your decision, whichever you decide. But be careful about quitting because someday you might get good at it. That was Rumsfeld's first rule that he tucked away and later shared in his leadership capacity. What a great, what a, what a great life lesson, wisdom and growing. Let me ask you, man of God, how are you growing? How are you growing now in this season of your life? How can you and I grow better? Walk with the wise, we'll grow grow wise. Sometimes we cannot walk in proximity with all of the wisdom. We read their books, but it's a good way to grow wise? What what is being inputted into the soul of your person and your masculinity? And I'm going to just shoot straight with you. If all we get inputted into our soul comes from the TV, we're going to be a messed up mess. Whether it's CNN or Fox, I don't care. I need more and better input into my soul than what's coming through Facebook and social media. I need more and better input into my soul than what's coming through the media outlets. I need men of God speaking into my life so that I can continue to grow. I've, I've been on this journey now as a, as a believer for 50 years, almost 50 years. I am so thankful for the men of God that the Lord placed on my growth journey, on my path. 
And I could let uh, Don Meyer, the former president of the University of Valley Forge, we were sitting down having a conversation one time, and he said, Don, can you identify three people who have had a significant influence in your growth and formation? I said, three? Let me tell you about a dozen. And went through the different chapters and seasons of my life, and it seemed like God always put groups of three in my life to help me grow and develop. Help me grow and develop as a believer. That was, that was season one. Then grow and develop as a pastor and as a servant. That was season number two. Grow and develop as a leader. That was season number three. I'm in the fourth quarter now. <laughs> And I still long for and look for people who will pull me up to another level. And then who can I share what God has given me and help them come up to their next level? Rise up, O oh man of God. As we bring this to a close, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. There's a couple of questions that I'd like us to prayerfully consider. The first question is this. Am I living as a man of God? Oh, friends, I'm going to break that down into its two pieces, man and of God. Young boys need a model of what men look like. We have come through a full generation of the emasculating of the male soul. It, it, I don't think it was intentional uh, from some people's point of view. I think it was strategic from the enemy's point of view. But over this last generation, in order to bring equity and equality for females up to a level, it meant emasculating men and putting them at another level. I'm concerned about that. When we hear boys not knowing whether or not they resonate with being a boy or if they're a, really a girl. I want to say this with all due respect because I don't know who's in the room. But friends, that is confused. Bruce Jenner, the poster child for confused. What does it mean? Do we, do we have to be mean and bombastic and, and, and roll over other people? No, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. That, that's not what I'm talking about. But being comfortable in your skin and who God created you to be and model that and download it and share it with your children. Do you know that it's, it's the, the, the father has so much to do with the identity formation of the son. And in a culture, again, in the last generation or two, we've had fathers who fathered children but never became a father to their children. And they either left the home, not only divorced their wife, but they divorced their family leaving this horrible void in the soul of young boys. But also, young ladies measure their femininity by their dad's masculinity. There is interplay there. And daughters are formed also. And it has long been established that confusion results when dad is absent from the picture. When he is left town, left the family, or he's in the family, but dissociated from it. We need to recover the masculine soul. 
and what that looks like in our day and in our generation. Being a man, but also being a man of God. Plugged into spirituality. Plugged into having this human divine connection that God wants to be my friend. That he wants to be intimately connected to my heart and soul and life and decision making and family leading. I want you to take it personally today. I want you to think about your context. And in the church, there are boys whose fathers are absent for one of the two reasons that I've that I've talked about. And they are looking for a male to show them the way. So whether it's youth ministry or kids ministry, or I'm high on Royal Rangers too. Until something better is invented, let's, let's, let's ride that horse until it falls. But downloading what it looks like to be a man of God. Would you stand with me? And I'm wondering if we could sing the chorus to that last song. And I'm wondering if you'll join me around the altar this morning. And let's ask God to make us into the man of God He wants us to be. Amen? Come as we sing. Victory I'm gonna see a victory God wants to use you and I to bring about a victory in our world today. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Let's press in close so that other guys who are coming can join us. Thank you so much. Lord God, We seek your face this morning. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Well, I have gone way over time. Here's what I'm going to ask. Number one, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you gotten to first base in your spirituality? The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's me, that's you, that's everyone. The question is, how are we going to deal with that? Are we just going to say, well, that's it. I'm human. You have to accept that. No, friend. The best thing we can do is when we come face to face with our failures and our humanity is look to God and ask Him to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the beautiful thing is, He will. If you're here today and you say, you know something, Pastor Don, that is something I need. I need God to to just come in and do the transforming work that only he can do. Uh, I'm open to that this morning. Would you pray that God will do that kind of a work in me? I want to ask Jesus into my heart, change my life. Here's my hand. Pray for me. If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up and right back down again? We'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. There are others that would raise their hand with these three brave souls. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, there's somebody else. Good. God bless you, friend. Yes, we're going to pray together. Now, this is deceptively simple. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all our iniquity. What does it take? It just takes an act of faith saying, hey, if God said it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to act on that. So we're going to pray the sinner's prayer right now. I'm going to ask everybody to pray it. If you didn't raise your hand and you should, probably should have you pray it with us here we go dear God I confess I've sinned 
I messed up. I knew better. Did it anyway. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Take my sins away. Forgive me, I pray. In the precious name of Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my life. And with your help, I will live for you from this day forward. So help me, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, for each one who prayed that prayer, reached out to you in this moment, I pray, Lord, you said in your word that now they are a new creation. The old is past. A new day has begun. I pray that, Lord, they will connect with other men and be formed and grow and mentored in their walk with Jesus. I pray for each one of us as men, Lord, that you will do a work in us, that, Lord, the work you do will give a good reputation, bring glory to your name, that, Lord, we be full of the Holy Spirit like they were in Acts both the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit operating in our lives. The Lord, we would grow in wisdom. Make us wise. So that, Lord, we can serve you well. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Now, Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Would you do that? Men, would you lift your hand up and just say, God, fill me. Fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with your wisdom. Fill me with the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. Let it grow in my life. Fill me, Lord. I pray that the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, will operate through my life. Not for my bragging, not for my recognition, Lord, but so that others will be well served and God will be well glorified. Lord, we'll thank you for these things. As we pray them today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say it with me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap.